<laughs> yeah, because I think there's a couple of options of how you want you can go live, gaming or just live. I think there's a couple of others. Okay, now I just need to change the permissions to make it public. Yep. Okay, and I go live now. Gaming. Oops. <laughs> I'm gonna close. I'm gonna close Facebook because I'm getting confused. Is this, it's still live though, right? Yep. Okay. Now where did Zoom go? Okay, here we go. I heard myself speak. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so hi, hi to the Facebook world, anyone who's watching. Um, yeah. Happy Friday. And uh, for anyone who is watching, Fridays are governed by the planet Venus. So great days for art, poetry, love, romance. Um, and uh, so it makes sense. Our friend Shanti hosts a dreamer's den every Friday at eight, talking about dreams. Um, such a perfect time for it. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, happy Friday. And we're here to talk about something very different from dreams, but not really. It's all kind of yeah. in the same realm. <laughs> but yeah, we're we're here, uh, basically, we've been healing our money stories together and out loud, while also speaking of uh, more, um, you know, logistical or applicable um, tips mm. for learning to be, I mean, for me, uh, be more responsible. I've definitely been irresponsible when it comes to spending, just really for um, lack of clarity. Um, so yeah, thank you both for joining. Of thank you everyone for tuning in. And welcome, welcome to Finance Friday. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I honestly, when you're saying that you, um, the irresponsible spending, all I, for me, what I, uh, the reminder I had on my head is that I've always been a responsible spender. Mm -hmm. And that is what has caused me tremendous amount of anxiety and fear around money. Mm -hmm. Because it comes from a place of wanting to control mm -hmm. without even knowing that that's what it was. Yeah. And when I became jobless, I felt like I lost all control of money, even though it wasn't true, but I felt like I lost all control. And it took me a couple of years to start feeling like I, I got it, that mm -hmm. I got the control back and that I know what I'm doing with the money. And here's the, the interesting part. I always know what I've been doing with my money and where it was going and how it was spending. Um, never had a late bill, knock on wood, <laughs> never had a late bill, none of those things. And yet, in my mind, I was telling myself that I am really bad at managing money. Mm -hmm. And that was only since I lost my job, right? I don't know what I'm doing. That's because I wasn't bringing my own money in. So it was kind of like tying into the whole money story, making me feel like I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, I was saving, investing, and doing these things and didn't know what I was doing. And then look back, I'm like, oh my God, I knew exactly what I was doing. Same yeah. thing, mm -hmm. yeah, the same thing I've been doing for years, but something has switched and changed. And that something was that my self-worth was gone because it was based on how much money I was making, mm -hmm. right? A lot of us are raised that way. Mm -hmm. um, that Those comments have been, I've heard those comments many times where, and one time it was said directly to me that our self-worth is determined by how much money we make. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, we don't make money, we earn money. <laughs> so um, that, that was one little lie that I caught in there. And the second is that we are the ones that determine our own self-worth. Mm -hmm. 
And when we go and get a job out there, it's somebody else who determines our self-worth and tells us, this is how much I think you're worth. Mm -hmm. So this is what you're going to get paid. And we say, awesome, thank you. I appreciate it. This is the best job ever. <laughs> and then we... Huh? I was just saying, thank you for paying me. <laughs> exactly. Thank you for paying me. But uh, there was something I was listening to a YouTube video of um, the writer of, I think, Kiyosaki, Dave Kiyosaki, I think his name is, writer of uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Uh, now, I wasn't fully paying attention, <laughs> to be quite honest, but there's a few things that he was saying in there that really intrigued me, and I want to go back and listen to it to fully understand what he was talking about. But he was talking about that the rich people they have a different way of looking at debt they don't see it as debt they see it as um an investment mm -hmm. right and he was talking about because again i wasn't fully paying attention but he was talking about when um a person starts up their own business and uh, you are the owner of your business, those are the type of people that actually pay a l the most in taxes. Whereas he can earn $1 million and then he takes that $1 million, he buys real estate with it. And in the end, he doesn't have to pay any taxes. So in hearing that, I'm like, I'm curious to explore that world because this is what everybody needs to know. Well, what about real estate taxes? Like, is he buying, is he buying land? He wasn't very clear. It was only like 11 million, uh, minute video. Okay. He wasn't very clear exactly what real estate he was buying, but um, it was real estate. Right. I don't I don't know, but that's what I'm saying, like exploring that and understanding what is it that the one percenters that are doing that continues to bring the money. And he one of the things he also mentioned was that um, when he has money that comes in, that's kind of like, uh, let's say, a line of credit. He takes that line of credit. He puts it into something else. And then in the end, he makes more money than he would have paid with interest. Mm -hmm. Right. And that makes sense to me because, I mean, some people do that in the stock market. Right. They take money that uh, they don't particularly have because it's coming out of some place uh, while they're living in debt, because most people are living in debt. They take money from a place where they do have it, but it's not necessarily theirs. And they put it into the stock market with how much they're comfortable losing because that's that's the game you're going to play and then come out if they play the game right come out with more in the end yeah so yeah what you're describing does actually to me sound like making money versus earning money and that's the difference between making money with your capital and earning money with your labor mm -hmm. so, so a lot of that the one percenters can make money off of their capital through that kind of moving the mm -hmm. funds and investing. And um, whereas the 99%, we earn money from our labor, which is a very different, um, it, it, it's much harder uh, when you're living paycheck to paycheck um, yeah. to expand that kind of income into capital. Yeah. See, my understanding of making money is quite different. My understanding of making money is actually physically making money and printing it, which the banks do, right? They're the ones that are making money and everybody else is earning money. There's just different ways of earning it. Um, and then there was something else he said that just popped into my mind is he, what he was talking about is entrepreneurs. A lot of people have a different 
uh, misconception of what entrepreneur means. Um, and when you go through this journey of entrepreneurship, there's a couple, a couple of years where you're not earning anything. And it's one of the greatest tests of what kind of entrepreneur you're going to become. Are you going to become um, someone who's going to be stealing from other people or are you going to become a better person? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I can, when I heard that comment, I thought, oh my God, that is so true. Because in these, in these years, since I've been entrepreneur and working on myself, I have like my, my moral compass has become so, um, I don't want to say tight, but more clear and more like, uh, there is like, there's right and wrong. And one way I see how some entrepreneurs, they go in the dark path because they just want to earn money and earn money and they don't care how they do it. Whereas others, they are working hard, putting a lot of time and effort and energy into what they're doing. And it takes them years to get there. But when they get there, the rewards are much, much, much greater and they last, right? And the ripple effect is a much different one from the one that would be a sc scamming other people. Yeah. And that, that requires a lot of patience and trust in the long game. And I think that the way that our society just operates, um, my time has sped up so much. We expect to see results instantly. I know um, my entrepreneurial journey has been so challenging, not because I don't trust myself and don't trust that the money's coming. I, I know it is. It's more that the, um, feels like the external world around me is just moving so fast and, and wants me to participate in the economy. Like my family wants to know I'm safe and fed. And um, it just feels like there's so much pressure to prove immediately that my entrepreneurial path, soulpreneurial entrepreneurial path is, is fruitful. And there's, I have no proof of that because it's all in my heart and my third eye vision. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's just that time. I, and I wonder if it was easier to embark on an entrepreneurial journey when uh when we were a more patient society and um had a, a longer view like i was thinking um so i left my job in 2017 my corporate job okay. and then 2018 um got my coaching certifications and I, I thought it wouldn't take too long to, um, you know, attract abundance, financial abundance. And it's taken a, a lot longer um, than I originally planned on, of course, because when do plans ever go the way we want them to? Um, and I'm actually asked about my journey a lot from people who want to or are interested in becoming coaches. And they ask me, well, how long? did it take you to start getting that money back? And um, for me, I mean, my journey is very different. I had a lot of healing to do before I could show up in my, my optimal you know, self, my full self. I had a lot of healing to do before I could even come live on Facebook and make videos. And so it's very different for everyone. And I think that each individual, it, if anyone has a, an entrepreneurial idea um, beating in their heart, and then it's worth the time and um, healing it takes to give birth to it and to just ease all that rut, that illusion that we need to rush. We got to prove mm -hmm. that it's going to make money. Um, you know, that's not for so many of us that's not what it's about like money is is a bonus it's definitely a bonus um but it's when we're following a kind of mission work it's mm -hmm. 
and we just trust. Yeah, like being an entrepreneur is very similar to that of the hero's journey. Yeah. It's, we're going at it on our own. There could be this separation, going into a cave, and then re-emerging as this new business and for the sake of entrepreneurship. And it's like, here's my business. Now I need to sell myself to everybody because this is new. Like I'm an entrepreneur. I saw an opportunity that I knew I had the value in doing, and now this is new. So there's gotta be this coming from a place of feeling whole mm -hmm. to be able to firmly step into yourself and be like, I deserve this energetic return for all the work I did mm -hmm. to build out this business. And like, I love how Yana, you talked about like being an entrepreneur, but also being a human being. So the human being isn't going to eat and it's not going to get paid but the entrepreneur is going to be thriving and being nourished off of the creation of the business. And how can we be honorable and not wear the two hats simultaneously and understand the muse of the business is the muse of the business and all the funds stay there and it's going to trickle over to me when it's ready. And I will eat it's like it's a part of the sacrifice. But in a way, like we're nourished mm -hmm. and we don't need to starve. Like the whole thing, like uh, I know Rachel talks about the starving artist and rewriting that story that we can be the thriving artist, mm -hmm. we can be the nourished artist, and we don't need to sacrifice, but we will go through a rite of passage. Mm -hmm. And it's important to acknowledge that rite of passage uh, because that does like build something. It does build character. It does do something. But let's not get fixated on the rite of passage and like stay in it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's an initiation. And yeah. um, it does, it builds a lot of strength, a lot of resilience. Um, and it, I, I think I spoke about this last time about just the new ways, new opportunities to perceive abundance. Like, um, you know, I've been living, um, you know, with what I, what I've got for the, the past three, four years. Um, and what I, where I found abundance is, I mean, really everywhere, like the water coming out of the faucet, um, springtime when, when everything starts growing again and finding that that mother earth really has got everything I need. Yeah, last time we talked about how looking at other humanitarian crises throughout the globe has given me that sense of, you know, I actually, though it looks like I'm broke by societal standards, I am actually very privileged because I can turn on the, the faucet mm. and just get water and I can bathe and shower and um and you know sleep peacefully at night like i have shelter so i have found that getting to that point um in, in terms of gratitude have been probably the most helpful just like the bare bones the basic necessities like getting really comfortable showing gratitude daily for our basic necessities has has probably been the biggest lesson toward building my, um, you know, my entrepreneurial journey. It's kind of like the like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. At the top is self actualization, and at the top of that pyramid, and that's where we hope that all entrepreneurial paths lead. Um, that everybody who chooses that path is self actualizing. At the bottom, it's our basic necessities. So I think that while we go through that that pyramid as a collective, as a society, we also do as individuals mm -hmm. make make sure that's met. And so with that, once that becomes the foundation, um, the possibilities are are limitless. You know, I know plenty of people who have a lot of money and would be considered the one percent, 
who do not show gratitude for what they have and mm -hmm. actually complain about lack, like lack of travel, lack of, you know, whatever um, their lives afford them that they might not be doing right now, you know, lack of, lack of houses, lack of cars, whatever it is. Um, and yeah, so it doesn't necessarily mean that um, the inner landscapes are full. Uh, that, that comes from, yeah, some more um, soulful excavation. So yeah, so to answer any of those questions about, you know, how long does it take when you become a coach to start making money, it all depends on the person. And um, if, if that is a fear, you've kind of got to walk through that fear. If you really mm. want to be a coach or a, a similar, you know, entrepreneur, you just got to see, you know, <laughs> you just find, yeah. you find out. <laughs> and it, it is, like you said, it is a hero's journey. Um, because when we were describing just the way that you started to be grateful for all the things that you have or basic necessities. Um, having gone from a place where you had good paying job, money, spending it everywhere to now uh, not having that and being grateful for all the things that you do have, that alone is a huge, like, I hear that as a hero's journey because it's almost like, I don't want to say you you take a person and you break them and then you rebuild them, but that's exactly what it is. It's kind of like exercise. It's a muscle. You go to the gym to rip your muscles to shreds. Mm -hmm. Then you sit, not necessarily hit, sit there, but you rest and you heal so you can become stronger and better version of yourself. So that is what an entrepreneurial journey is actually like. So in other words, it's not for the faint of heart. It's not for people who are afraid of failure. Um, I mean, we all are, but those that are petrified of failure. Um, but then again, it could be just the right thing for you. Yeah. So you face your fear head on and see that that's the best thing can ever happen to you. One of my favorite quotes that I live by, and it's right there, massive and perfect action. And then I added equals success. Mm, I love that. Right. Um, that's how I started doing things just I don't need to know everything I, about what I'm doing I'm just going to get in there do it massive imperfect action otherwise I'll be spending a lot of time learning and getting my head in the in the right place like and and then and then doing something about it um if that was the case we wouldn't have done our workshop yeah. <laughs> right <laughs> we would have spent years preparing for it um but we put it together in in a month if even a month, right? And that wasn't an everyday thing because it's it's a lot of mental work. Um, if that was the case, I wouldn't have done a lot of things, right? I probably would still be living with my parents. Um, and then when you were talking about um, how long does it take for someone to become a coach, I can give you a few examples of my class, okay? So we had 11 people in the classroom, including myself. Uh, there was one person who got a client while she was still in class um, on second module. And then there was um, there was a couple of people that were just doing it for their for their work, right? For for themselves, for their work so they could bring it to the workplace. Um, so I don't know how that worked out for them. I haven't reconnected. And then there was one person who um, who got three clients after the last module was done but she did not graduate she failed the first time she did the exam right so by the time that she went to do the exam the second time uh and she finally passed at that point she had she she went through four clients one of them was let go because it, was, it wasn't a right fit right so and then and then for myself i have a couple of clients but i do barter coaching so mm -hmm. It's basically, I do get paid, but in different ways, right? We exchange services. Um, some people are still, they have no, uh, they have no clients and no one near them. Some people, they've had a couple of sessions here and there. Um, 
for a very, very, very low price. Some people have had people that paid for a session, never showed up um and that's right <laughs> money, <laughs> Free money. Oh, right. <laughs> exactly and then there was one lady uh who got a client in the beginning of second module she paid her but didn't start coaching until just now and it's been basically a year because mod two was in february and um i myself graduated in um in july that's when i got my certificate um and yeah that's pretty much when the school was done like june july so that's just a, a couple of different examples of what that could look like some people we even heard that there was in the previous classes that there were some students who had 20 clients before the second module so it honestly Having been on this uh, entrepreneurial journey and uh, a network marketer as well, it's all about who you know and how many people you know. It's all about your network and how willing are you to go and put yourself out there and talk about what is it that you do, what do you have to offer, what problem are you solving? That's it. People don't really care what you do. They just want to know, what can you do for me? What problem can you solve for me? So that's all it is, right? And all of these people that had these clients, they were from conversations. Yeah. Right? And also, Yana, I've just got to say, you are really great at, um, like, some, some of the things I admire about you is you're really great at following up at asking for testimonials, at putting them out there. And that's also what it takes. And it can vary from person to person. I, for example, if I ask once for a testimonial and someone says, sure, sure, I'll get it to you. And then don't, you know, I, I recognize I'm like, all right, what am I, what could I do differently? You know, and following up would be one thing. Um, so it really all depends on who we are and, um what the entrepreneurial like what the service is like some yeah. services are much easier to sell than others like i would think that selling you know being a personal trainer for the body is probably an easier service to sell than being a personal trainer for the mind mm -hmm. because that's something that we can see we can see physical mm -hmm. results you know people really like those before and after pictures I can't really show anyone a before and after of a client's life. I can. I can show you my driver's license from five years ago to now, um, and you would see the difference in, in my eyes. I was looking at them. I'm like, oh, my God, I look like a different person. This was a broken version of myself when I, my muscle was torn and ripped, and I was resting, right, healing. And this one was just when was it in october i think we went to take a picture and i i showed my husband oh my god look you have two different wives <laughs> yeah. Yeah, i have a similar i have a similar time stamp it's like i've done all this personal work i've been in my own cave but pretty much up till when COVID happened i've been in, in a cave COVID happened began to create and show more of what i've been doing mm -hmm. um especially like out in the world and spreading the word and being linked up with multiple people collaborating oh yeah i love that and it's like okay so up until getting the eli assessment with rachel i didn't really have anything to quantify all the work i've done minus this photo from 2012 where i just looked like a completely different person and now when i see people that knew me 10 years ago, they don't recognize me until I start to speak or unless we actually like engage with eyes. It's like, that's the proof. Like that's what I have for myself. And it's hard, <clears throat> it's hard. We're not like, we are artists, artists of the body. Mm -hmm. Like the body's the clay, we're the potter. We're not like creating an art piece that's on the wall or we're creating mugs for the home that like repeatedly have great use but we're creating a stronger sense of person and self mm -hmm. 
which I guess like the testimonial would have to be, I'm not like now thinking, like the testimonial would have to be that encapsulation of the work mm -hmm. we've done with somebody. Yeah. That would be the final Mona Lisa. I mean, like. that's, that's a great way to put it. Yeah. I remember talking with my, my first coach um, and I was like, I just want to keep paying. I want to pay you a million dollars for what she's done. And I want to pay my first coach a million dollars as well. So when I have it, my first coach is going to get it. Right. Like, like you, you know, like for what? And there's just, I mean, there is a way to quantify, like you mentioned the ELI. Um, I do have my results from 2013 and my results from 2017. And, and I know what those um you know what those results show um it's just still not as um i don't know maybe because we are a super superficial society it's not as um it's not like showing a before and after of like mm -hmm. here's me scrawny and you know like yeah out less on and here's me like ripped and toned um it just doesn't have the same like, so it's a bit harder to sell and uh -huh. um especially what the work that I do, it's, it's so, um, it takes place deep in the spiritual realms. Like what I'm doing is going in with my clients and um, rec reclaiming all those parts of themselves that have fractured off and have never been visited again. And we're traveling through these caves and caverns like you know, I'm holding the flashlight while my client's taking the ax pick and just like, you know, digging away. And, um, and that's such an intimate and, and deep journey. And um, so it's very, it's just different. Like there's all, there's different kinds of, of entrepreneur entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and, and some services are going to be a bit easier to sell and than being like yeah come come join me for some like shadow work that's gonna <laughs> crush you and break you open and uh <laughs> yeah yeah you know, cause you to question everything you've ever experienced in your life and then reevaluate <laughs> and then build yourself back up and choose oh. Like, yeah. yeah, who would want to do that? Like, Light me up. <laughs> <laughs> most people say no. The, there's a reason I love the words uh, like self mastery or becoming the grand master of yourself. But those are the words that do not attract very many people because it actually scares a lot of people away. So I've stopped using those words. Right, I, I had to stop using those words because people were feeling scared and intimidated by those words, understandably enough. Because mm -hmm. if I heard those words three years ago, I'd be like, uh, no, yeah. no, I'm not doing that. But I like how you got, both of you guys mentioned the ELI, because that is the way that I present it is I always say that this is something tangible that, you get to walk away with something that you can actually see that measures your energy level and how you're showing up on your regular day and stressful situations or days or times and then it allows you to actually have more choices come into your into your field so it's almost like um an energy scan like if we, if we had an mri of our brains before and after and how our energy and our body was showing up um kind of like when you were talking about that physical body where you're standing and you show this is what i look like with the belly out and this is what i look like with the you know the washing board now um that's easy to see but if there was a scan of the mind and the body and an energy um like an mri i don't think it would catch the changes but eli to me, that's that scan that allows you to see, this is what I was, this is what my my mind was like before I started this program, this coaching, or this personal growth journey, however you want to go about it, right? Um, and then afterwards, when you take it, when you're done, you're never done, uh, but when you are ready to take another one, I always say, 
wait at least six months because it takes about six months to see the changes and then take another one six months or 12 months later and then you can see the difference and then that is what you can show to people this is my body before yeah, yeah. This is my body after my energy body yeah. which is really what our bodies are like our body is really like one percent of what makes of, of who we are True. and what people um no, it's it's so interesting. I've I've been complimented on my energy uh, for years now. I wasn't before I started working with a coach. Um, I was complimented for being a fun drunk and um, stuff like that, but not just for my energy or my presence. And then in the past couple of years, I noticed that I've been complimented on my energy a lot. And, um, and I thought that was cool because I was like, oh, it, you know, it does show up as energy and it helped me to let go of any attachment or a judgment of my physical appearance because I started realizing people don't care what I look like, you know, like they, they care how, how they feel around me. And um, forgot, oh yeah, so why, why I started talking about that is what I find is that people think that it's me, it's like specific to me and um and i always remind them like it's you too like you've got this mm -hmm. energy like it's actually all of our resonant energy mm -hmm. is is to be in that you know high high vibrational state um and and so when i tell people you know whatever you see in me is actually a reflection of what's what's within you um i wonder what but I know we've gotten kind of like off topic of um, <laughs> we had a topic finance yeah <laughs> yeah but again money is energy so yeah. if you are vibrating because what I was hearing you say it, like that the energy is not for reserved for the few right it, you can have that energy as well you can come across that same way that you come out rachel and i've had many of those compliments as well which are always welcome by the way um mm -hmm. and some people just they seek me out and they want to spend more more time with me for that energy yeah. remind them that you have that in you and that's the way that you can recognize it. all of us have it, it we are not the elite of the energy yeah. all of us have access to that and once we tap into that and we work with that energy and work towards our desires mm -hmm. money starts to come in Mm -hmm. Right. So that's why the energy talk is, in, in my experience and in my opinion, is extremely important, if not the most important when it comes to the money conversations, because money is energy. We've heard this many, many times and we've said this many times. I know, Rachel, you've said that a billion times. So every time we talk about money, it's always money is energy. That's because it is. So if you don't get your energy in the right balance and you have that scarcity, mental, uh, scarcity mindset and thoughts coming in, then nothing is going to come in because that door that scarcity mindset closes the door yeah mm -hmm. that's actually so important to remember when we are re rewriting our money stories if and this is why i brought up last week identifying billionaires we admire because if we are calling money evil and billionaires evil then the money which is just energy is is gonna say well then they don't want me i'm not gonna go to them if they're if they're mad at me mm -hmm. um and <clears throat> it also i love this this bringing it back to energy because this reminds me um you know what you were saying at the beginning yana about when i brought up irresponsible spending and and you brought up control um so control is the mindset of money when when we're resonating at level three energy that's how we feel about money at, at level three and at level four we feel charitable is charity so when you brought up control i thought about um back when i was at my six figure salaried job i loved um you know paying the bar tab i loved inviting people to come to live shows with me in house of blues in the foundation room having my own crew so from there coming from a very um you know levels four five six place like everybody come like share 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 this is what's mine is yours 
yet if anything went wrong or something didn't go as like dreamy as my vision was of how the time would be i would contract into control and uh resentment um which is that resentment is not necessarily in myself of money but it'd probably be level two which is greed so so let's not kid ourselves we've all experienced greed um and so it's not just there's the greedy and then there's the 99 percent. no we've all experienced it i've experienced yeah. it um and then yeah scarcity so it'd be like for example let's, uh, let's say that there's a show i invite 10 people to come party with me in the foundation room um i could get the tickets just by emailing house of blues like the the girl there was nikki she was awesome and I just like, Nikki, hook me up with 10 tickets. And it would just automatically come out of my, my credit card. And I was happy to do it until friends started uh, making it complicated or, um, you know, not, not kind of like following my instructions of, you know, look, I don't want to deal with getting everybody up there the 10 minutes before the show. So you know, let everybody know. And then as soon as people, you know, it was 10 minutes for the show and I'd be getting texts of like, hey, I'm down here. Can you, you know, come get me or whatever. Then my energy would go from charitable, let's all have a good time to, oh, like, damn it. Why didn't they read my email? Like, I'm never doing this again. Just very controlling and resentful. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that reminded me so much of that. Um, like when you said control, I was like, oh yeah, mm -hmm. I have experienced that. Yeah. How, I'm curious, how did your parents, uh, if your parents gave you money or paid for something and you didn't react in the way that they wanted you, how was their response? Um, I'm trying to think. So Um, I, I think that it, it would be more of a long-term kind of thing. So if they gave, if they ever gave me money for something, um, you know, I'd be so grateful and that'd be all great. You know, it would feel like, oh, unconditional love. Cool. Until I advocated for a different kind of support, let's say emotional support until I advocated, you know, so like I would tell them words of affirmation are my love language, you know, I need this kind of support. Then that's when they would say, you know, your father gave you this much money for this. We support you. How can you say we don't support you? And then it would start feeling like a conditional exchange. And um, yeah, and I feel like a privileged, you know, <laughs> monster, like, <laughs> um yeah so definitely yeah at first it'll all be lovely and amazing but then um when it it would become conditional as soon as I would say I it's not the fight like I love the financial support but what would really help me thrive as I'm growing my business would be a different kind of support and um but that that was my own thing I had to move past and you know, yeah. I'll, I'll take whatever support they know how yeah. to provide. And if it's, you know, more than the physical world, um, which it, it is, you know, it's there. They were here to make sure I stayed alive <laughs> and fed and sheltered. And they did an amazing job of it. So I just focus on that. But yeah, the, to answer your question, it would kind of like bite me in the ass down the line of it. Yeah. Yeah, no, it makes sense. And th those are the kind of experiences that make us as well. And then we can find ourselves showing up in a similar way mm -hmm. in our lives when, because that's what I wanted to ask. The reason why I wanted to ask is because how you explain how you were showing up for your friends that you gave them money and you tickets but it's it's money right it's in the form of a ticket you get them a ticket you do something nice for them and they're not doing it in the way that uh they're not accepting it in the way that you were expecting them to so this is where 
your past experiences may come through and certain ways that we tend to react to situations. And I say react because we're, you know, we're reacting instantly is usually the way that we're used to, that we are familiar with. We're not going to come out of some, um, from one kind of way of living and all of a sudden have a different view on how we are going to approach our life and the people in our life and including our children. It's going to come from a place that uh, is within ourselves that was embedded into us from our childhood. So how our parents showed up for us is how we will continue to show up for everyone in our life until we become aware of it and then recognize that this is not what we want this is not me this is my parents or this is the shows that i used to watch all the time right because if we were always watching shows on tv that's going to become part of us and then decide of who we want to be mm -hmm. yeah i can't help but um think about how we attach these different energetic patterns to money like greed corruption power but it's not the money it's 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 the person behind it mm -hmm. and those patterns aren't necessarily tied to just money either if we look at how we relate to our lives we can find that we might be greedy with food or greedy with relationships greedy with time I corrupt with time, time. Yep. power complexes over pets power complexes over something you own and like money for those types of personas is like gas to fire. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's, oh gosh, now I can really extend my will onto everybody else. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So like how like so truly like these conversations of rewriting our energetic profile so we can show up to use money pure within that white light, like is the way. We grow up in, like, we're born into situations. You can believe in karma or you may not believe in karma. That's okay. But we can also look at the situation we're in and be like, I'm not happy here. And then decide to make choices to change that. Like, it's within everybody's power to decide to wake up and put your right leg in the pant leg first instead of your left. Like it's all up to us and we can like make those choices internally and then take the money, use debt as investments, mm -hmm. paying $10,000 for a coaching certificate isn't putting yourself into debt. It's putting yourself, like it's helping yourself grow. Though it may feel like you're lessening how much money you have, you're just balancing, you're changing the balance, you're changing the scale a little bit yeah and leveraging and taking the leap of faith into yourself yeah increasing your own value yeah. and that's the best thing you can do because then even if you increase your own value and then you go out there and um you say yes to a paycheck the paycheck is going to be bigger because they'll see more value in you is it going to be what you're actually worth no it's not going to be what you're actually worth because i believe each and every one of us is uh, you can't even put a value right uh but i'm unfortunately yeah. <laughs> we're infinite being <laughs> yeah um so that's that's the other i guess side to it and that um we also value what we invest like for our education differently so for me, the value that I felt in investing in coach training was like, it was like, I finally found what I, what I wanted to educate myself in mm -hmm. and compared to the loan I took out for law school, like law school was a $150,000 loan. And I took, I signed that away, like signed my soul away to that without having any idea of why I wanted to be a lawyer or if I even wanted to be a lawyer. When, when I chose IPEC coach training, I knew exactly why I wanted to go. Like it was, an, it was like, the, and it was the most exciting 
um, adventure. Like when I received my, my coach training, my, um, you know, the diploma that we get when we, when we graduate, it was the, the, that piece of paper meant so much more to me than my law school diploma. And I remember in my office back, back when I was at CBRE, I had an office and everybody had their diplomas and awards up in their offices. So I had my, my undergrad diploma, my law degree, my, my law school diploma, um, and some awards. And people would come in and be like, ooh, and like compliment that compliment me and like, oh, you're a lawyer? I didn't know that. And I'd be like, yeah, you know. And I never felt any connection to what was on my wall, other than my my undergrad, which you know, I went for English, major in English. And I think everybody knows I love English. I love writing. So that mm-hmm. does actually mean something to me. Um, but the law law degree really meant nothing. So I, I signed away, you know, that, that much debt. That's when I would consider it debt. Although there were some takeaways. I still have one of the papers that I wrote for law school that I did love. Um, but that's when it, it, that felt like debt to me because there was no clarity. Um, whereas the coach, yeah, the coaching felt like an investment because I had so much clarity. Um, But, and then the celebrations from both, like when I had got my, you know, my coach diploma in the mail, um, I thought it was like, for me, it was like one of the biggest deals of my life. I was like, this is the first time I had clarity and and focus and knew why I was going into this. And it meant so much to me and uh, and my family, um, you know, it just wasn't the same response as when I got my law school diploma. It was just a very different, you know, when I graduated from law school, there was a party. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> graduated from coach training. I'm like, where's my party at? No? Okay, cool. Um, so it's just the way we value these different educational mm-hmm. programs are, is so different and very um, curated by the status quo when really um, I've, I've learned more through actually coaching would be so helpful in the in the law um legal industry they should really all like, learn this stuff and it would save a lot of time I, I love what you said about clarity and clarity helping to differentiate an investment from debt mm-hmm. yeah i'm like looking around my home and I've seen, I see the things that I've got, and I'm like, those were all investments. And now I'm thinking about things I've purchased that didn't last long and I threw away. Like, that's debt. That's just money thrown away. And when I put thought, and like I'm looking at these things that I, I put significant thought into these investment items. Mm-hmm. And like, I didn't just throw my money at them. I thought about it, went for it and like broke through frugality in order to buy the best thing that I knew would last the longest and was most well made versus something I'm just buying out on a whim with no thought. Mm -hmm. And like, that's debt. Investment is like that continuous clarity of knowing where it's going and what you're getting back for it. Mm -hmm. That's a great way of saying it, like that investment is something that you invested in and then you're getting things back for it. Uh, Now, I still don't like the word debt uh, because it doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. So there are many things that all of us have, whether purchased, whether they're physical things or classes, of course, that we've taken that uh, felt like debt. But I just like to call them expensive lessons. Yeah, it's still an investment because we don't like when we go to to school, right? When we're all forced to go to school and sit on a desk and listen to the teacher all sitting in lines, right? Lines this way and lines this way. Um, We. Right. I just have to you know, say the conforming part of it. Um, and, and I get it. I understand it. But most kids, when they walk out of school, they what they've learned has actually set them behind because we 
everything around us continues to change and in cycles I, I if i remember correctly it's about every 18 months um that's where we hit a new cycle and things change so when kids come out of school they are already behind on what they should have learned or where they kind of should be what's expected i don't like that word should but uh i'm gonna use it anyways because <laughs> Um, so what happens is then that becomes expensive lessons, right? That becomes the lessons for everyone, even though they're not paying for it, but time-wise they are because they could have been learning something else. And most schools don't teach the most crucial things for kids that they need out there to go and learn, um, like communication skills, they are taught, but very, very, very limited. Um, budgeting is not taught unless you're taking a specific class. How to buy your first home, how to buy your first car, how to invest. Um, and really, all of the entrepreneurial skills of what it takes to become an entrepreneur, because this is what most of us actually are. When we go out there into the world, we seek what we desire most in terms of how much am I going to get paid for this job, for doing this job, for doing that job, for doing that job. So, um, and then when we grow up, there are expensive lessons, there are expensive mistakes. And I don't like to call them that because that's heavy, right? It's like a bag or a big backpack I'm putting in myself, but by calling it an expensive lesson, it eases that pain. That means I learned something. And typically we do learn a lot from those expensive lessons, from those expensive mistakes, right? Um, we learn a lot, sometimes even more. Oh, yeah. Or else, because like you learned quickly that law wasn't something that you wanted to go into, right? So if you did go into it, that means that you would have been living this expensive lesson for a much longer period of time. But by learning that lesson fairly quickly, this is not for me. Yes, I've spent 150 grand on it, but it's a lesson. And I'm glad that I learned it now than I would have 10 years ago, where it would have been that much more harder to walk away from it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, as you were speaking, I was thinking of, um, I was kind of picturing, you know, one path that leads toward alignment, and then, like, the journey, uh, I don't know, the, the, the journey, the, the random walk that trends toward alignment, but it certainly is a random walk, and, mm -hmm. um, and it does, I, I like thinking of it as, yeah, it is um, actually in the long run, way more expensive to deviate from alignment for longer periods of time. So the sooner that we can identify that deviation and course correct, um, the less expensive mm -hmm. the, the lesson is like, yeah, there's, there's a timeline of me out there somewhere where I did continue practicing law and probably all stressed out and um, it is so interesting. Like one of the things in um, when I was working at a law firm before I was working at a commercial real estate firm, um, one of my jobs was to keep time. So anytime my my boss, um, you know, would would write an email or make a phone call, he'd let me know, and I'd I'd do point one, um, and then at the end of the day, add up all the time. So just thinking about time um and you know when you know it's different levels of consciousness you get more comfortable with time until you're living in the now and time is infinite it's um illusory and um but then so i was thinking about wow they have to be so focused on time every day and and, and that's like I mean, the, the quote, time is money, like mm -hmm. really sh um, shows itself in that kind of career. And that's something that like even being conscious of time was taking away from my energy that I could invest in any certain projects, just always being aware, like, okay, you know, point one, like, um, and 
Uh, so I'm so grateful because had I chosen that, had I, um, you know, if it was part of my responsibility, part of my responsibility to be that focused on time, every time I send an email, um, every time I communicate with someone, I think it would really mess with me and um, my levels of stress because mm -hmm. when I now, you know, I still write emails to clients and I have zero awareness of time because I am traveling so deep and it doesn't matter how long it takes me to write the email. Um, so just, yeah, such an interesting thing to think about how, how these different careers can sh really shape our mindsets based on, you know, that based on how they attract money. And um, so something where you have to keep track of time like that. Um, I was really glad <laughs> that I didn't mm -hmm. deviate that long. It would, it would have just created a completely different human being out of my mind. It's crazy to me that there aren't studies or presentations to these companies being like, if you just let the employee be themselves, they'll have productivity. And by harping on them and creating this focus on time, you're taking away from their productivity, which is going to cost you more That's in the long study. run. Um, I was actually looking up studies today. I was looking up productivity studies, um, but there are there there are definite there are studies out there. It's, it's just a matter of if the organizations want to actually invest in what it would take. You know, I was looking up studies of um, the cost of turnover, employee turnover, mm. and um, it said it could be, you know, the cost of a of an employee leaving, hiring a new employee could take about six to nine months of um, a yearly salary, and um, so yeah, there there are studies out there on productivity um, based on that kind of stuff, like what engages the employees, what makes them feel good, uh, how, how to retain talent. And um, yeah, it's just a matter of if the CEOs and shareholders and partners want to feel that that's worthy of an investment. Mm -hmm. And, um, but yeah, I was looking it up because Jan, I, wa I wanted to, um, start making some powerpoints that we can put out there now that i've i've gotten into making powerpoints again <laughs> but yeah i want to make a powerpoint that shows you know this this kind of work could really save companies a lot of money mm -hmm. yeah you know time is money yeah it i remember um i used to work at a, a branch uh, at the bank where we it was one of the highest turnover branches in Ontario in the whole province of Ontario um and I mean I I know why because the boss was a boss was not a leader and um more like a, a drill sergeant mm -hmm. I remember we were <laughs> one year we did the secret santa and I got her as a secret santa so I got her a sergeant <laughs> <laughs> and of course she was not surprised that oh yes this is perfect right this is me you guys know um so really really high turnover and and that is one of the reasons why this boss was so stressed and so upset because it costs so much money and time to train people mm -hmm. um because they, when you have someone who's been working there for even a year they already have an extensive amount of knowledge having worked in that branch because it's very busy. There's, you get all kinds of transactions, right? So it's the best place to be trained. Um, and I, I remember that the way that I, I would train people myself is within a week to be on their own. Whereas most people, when they train them, they're, they're scared to put them on the front to do things on their own because they're not ready. Uh, maybe in the first couple of hours, they're not ready, but by the end of the first day, they're more than ready. Yep, yep. Put those skills into practice right away. It's like that, that quote that I say, um, that life is not 
an information process, life is an application process. So the same principle applies to employees and employers. And if you want to, and, and this, this is the reason why I brought it up is because um, eventually this boss went into training to become um, a better boss. And she came back uh, more of a leader than a boss. No, it was an iPad coach training because I've actually ended up going through that training myself because I was like, oh, if she comes back and she is this different person, a much better version of herself and the and the morale of staff, everything, the productivity, everything improved by just one person changing. I want to go through that. So I've gone through that. I actually still have uh, it's like a, this many notes and, and books and, and stuff in there that I kept and I still have it. I haven't looked at it for a couple of years. Um, but now I'm curious to go through it and see and, and remember what I learned there and how does that apply into today's yeah. world. Yeah. What I find so interesting. So um, when I was at CBRE, I was sent to a lot of leadership conferences and um, so they, I, they identified me as a leader enough to send me to these conferences where we would learn that kind of stuff. Like I remember the Massachusetts Conference for Women. Um, I went to a breakout session where they talked about, it was called How to Lead When You're Not a Designated Leader, I believe was the name of it. And I was like, that's perfect for me because nobody on the team um, thought that my, I guess that my leadership was was good enough for them to uh, feel okay with my, like what I had to mm -hmm. offer. So, um, you know, they still wanted to, to that approval from my boss. So even if I was like, great job, you know, it, it wasn't quite enough. Um, so yeah, it was perfect for me. And they talked about growth mindset versus fixed mindset and how the the great the best leaders have continuous growth mindset um, and um, so a lot of the same things that we learn um, the difference between catabolic and anabolic leaders and um, every time I come back from one of these leadership conferences and report back and and be like these are the changes that need to be made <laughs> and um, what I found interesting was it just there was something missing. Uh, the, the changes would not ever be made. Um, and one thing, like as you're talking, I, I remember something that really stood out and it was someone on my team one day was crying at her desk. And I, I asked her, I was like, why are you crying? And she started telling me a bit about just the, really it was about our boss's energy and how she said she said she goes home every day and cries and i i looked at her and i was like they are not worth it they are not worth your tears <laughs> like um and if and i remember talking with my boss a bit and i was like i am not here to trick anyone or coerce anyone into staying i'm not here for that if they want to leave, I'm going to empower them to leave. And um, yeah, I don't think my boss quite got what I was saying, <laughs> but I was like, I'm not going to put anyone, like, and I explained to him um, in kind of my final conversations with him about why I was leaving. And I would tell him, I was like, you've painted all these pictures for me of what my future within this company is going to look like. And, it, and this has been years now and none of it's happening. And I was like, I don't think you were lying to me. I, th I think you felt you were under duress to keep me. And he was like, I was, I was under duress. And I was like, no, <laughs> you could have just been transparent and left it up to me to make my own decisions. Um, and I don't know if it really stuck. Um, like he, he still seemed really stressed. Like that conversation, I remember exactly where we were. We we're in a cafe in Boston. I was drinking Turkish coffee. And um, I remember feeling very calm and patient and really wanting him to understand. And he was still acting as though he was under duress. Like, 
as though he had to like flash something in front of my face to get me to stay. And I was just, I was like, it's, it's not about that. Um, so yeah, it just seems to be like, there's, there's just something missing there. Um, you know, yeah, that, that leaders, that the designated leaders almost think they have to trick people into staying by, <clears throat> by painting these pictures of the future at the company. And really, if they're just transparent, I'm like, look, this, you're, you're probably, there's not much growth here. Um, so if that's okay for you, that's great for us. And just be clear about it from, from the outset because young people want growth and opportunities. So, and, well, and but they maybe- promise it. Was, was they, that's what they promise that growth and opportunity. Yeah. And that's their way of getting that person to buy into it and give all they can because they make these promises, mm -hmm. right? And then when they're not kept, uh, some people are not um, confrontational enough to go up and say, where, where are all the things that you promised? Yeah. Right. You told me I was going to be here by now and do this and do this to that. Why is it not here? It's been two years past that deadline where you told me it was going to happen. And you were able to go and have that confrontational conversation that most people including myself, would not have had. I was only able to have it after I had nothing left to lose. I wasn't afraid of losing my, like, I knew I was done. I had already said a lot. Like, <laughs> I had said a lot in that, on those, in those last, like, I, um, I went after the, one of the, the conferences, the leadership conferences, the um, marketing team asked me to write a review for their LinkedIn page, the company's LinkedIn page of the event. And I was like, all right. <laughs> uh, and I wrote it and I wrote things like, I was like, the leaders here failed us <laughs> because I was writing all basically, um, I didn't know then that it was the anabolic leader I was, I was writing about and um but that's what i was writing about that's what i was learning and um and so then i kind of wrote the juxtaposition of, of everything i was learning of what my company was doing so i had i had already been pretty vocal and pretty you know had i still cared about my future there and was still like if i was still attached to it mm -hmm. i wouldn't have had the courage to to just like objectively be like i don't care I'm just telling you straight up everything you're saying. There's been this pattern and it's not fooling me anymore. And I don't even care. Like, even if any of that stuff was going to come into my life, if I stay here, I don't even want it anymore. Mm. Um, it doesn't mean anything to me anymore. And so that's, that's why I had the courage to, I was already kind of, I was done. I was just completely objective and it was such a different place to have these conversations from because I wouldn't get caught up in the, the kind of like drama and triangulation and smoke, smoke bombs. I just kind of like watch, you know, as my boss would kind of go in circles and I just keep watching from the outside and I was like, it's not about that, man. I'm, I'm just out. Um, so that's why I was able to have that conversation. Like everybody, everybody already knew. It was just a matter of like, I still wanted to have those conversations thinking that I could help on my way out, help um, the culture there a bit. But I, I just did not care. <laughs> did not care at all. Um, I was done. Yeah, and I just knew too much about energy at that yeah. point. And these these corporate environments, they really um they cause an imprint, and if it's not established within growth or leadership, something that the organization has to truly seek out to ensure it doesn't leave its employees or even like the management behind or anyone involved in the organism behind. I, this is why I'm like feel very very lucky to have had uh, corporate experience working mm -hmm. for Target. 
um, being a part of their executive leadership team. From the moment I was hired, I was or from the moment I was interviewed, it was leadership training. From the moment I got hurt, like for the four years I was within the company, it was all leadership training. And I was like right at the level just next to store manager. And I was training with the store manager, but then we were training everyone below us to the point where it's like a culture of leadership, a culture of empowerment. Everybody within my work center knew that there was opportunity for growth. And that if you wanted to just be, so I was in charge of the front end, cashiers, guest service, and a Starbucks. And if you wanted to come in and just be a cashier, cool. That's great. But if you want the opportunity to grow, we knew, like, we let everyone know. It's like, just ask. Mm -hmm. And we'll give you more opportunity. But we won't know unless you ask because we don't want to throw things on you that you're not ready for. And we would constantly be having these feedback sessions um, between myself and the leaders, leaders and myself, myself and the team members, checking in to see their leaders were keeping them well. And we had a really nice thing going where we understood how we, we understood that sometimes um, we need to be stern and firm to ensure that we stay in line. But we also had safeguards to make sure that even though there was someone stern, like say my manager below me for the team who ran the team, he was stern. I was always happy that day. I was never upset and the team could always come to yeah. me. There was always this layer of knowing. So it's like, if I need to bring the hammer down, like we would talk about it as a leadership team. So if like they knew that I needed to bring the hammer down, the, the leaders would then be there for the team as like the safe space to talk to. Mm. But like we understood the different energetic levels of leadership and sometimes the word of one level up just carried more weight yeah. because of the level that they were at. Yeah. And we were all just different scopes of work doing the same exact thing. And like, like these were things I learned just as Target was teaching, just churning leadership expectation. Like how do you relate to others? How do you communicate effectively? How do you champion others? And then it was, would be interesting to witness when ego would come into play because some of these people were taking on these leadership expectations but couldn't accept others' interpretations of the same exact leadership expectations. So I would, a peer of mine who trained me within my store, I like learned everything from her but I adapted it to be who I was. And through that adaptation, I would witness her try to sabotage different things I was trying to do up front. And it was like, okay, I see what's happening. I'm not gonna change my leadership style, but it's just interesting to see how then ego can come into play. And then we'd have to have these conversations, like what is going on? Where is this disconnection? Why aren't we following the same path? And then, it would like come down to, well, in the moment I needed to do this. So I'd be like, okay, well, I understand that. Mm. But in the moment doesn't need to be, be a continued pattern, which is what I'm noticing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a huge difference between understanding the concepts of leadership, being taught the concepts and being able to speak them and actually embodying them. Yeah. And that's what I thought probably the biggest uh, points of disconnect were um, in my the it sounds like in your experience you're all taught the same thing some of you are embodying it some could just give it lip service and same and same thing going on in my company and my former company and um and it actually at times was a little uh, devastating like when there were people i really trusted in designated leadership positions like people outside of my direct bosses other partners, especially female partners. I, I don't know if I mentioned before, but um, my company, where, where I was working at the time, there were 78 partners and only five were female. And I was being told that I was in the funnel to be a, a partner. And um, probably because I was a female and they were looking around like, we need another one. Um, Diversity. Yep. 
Yeah. And um, and so I really looked up to the the five female partners and um, and they uh, you know, for the most part, were, were a different generation. So I had a lot of understanding for where they were coming from because generation to generation times do change a lot and culture does change a lot. So, you know, one of them explain, was explaining to me um, because I kind of had lost patience with the way that they would talk about one another. And I'd be like, I don't want to hear it anymore. I don't want to, like, I don't know what, um, like one, one moment in particular, one female partner wanted me to, she asked me what I thought about another female partner and I remember just like losing patience. And I was like, I don't know, I've never had an interaction with her. I know what you want me to say about her. I know what my boss wants me to say about her, but I don't, you know, like I knew the political game and I knew that I could play along. I could have said ex the exact gossip that I had been fed and that would advance my standing. And, um, but I just lost, lost my patience. And, um, and so what I recognize is a lot of these people are, uh, understand conceptually what it means to be a leader. They, they are reading my notes and the emails I send about the conferences when I, when I learn from them and, like oh great cool 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 um but there was this this disconnect when it came to embodying but then looking back i'm like okay so um they did those those five female partners came like came up um whatever you know that the terminology came to come up in a company and in an industry so they were coming up they were rising in the real estate industry at a very different time when it was a bit more cutthroat like they would remind me all the time it's a man's world it's a man's world and we all have to kind of like every man for himself kind of thing whereas the way that I was seeing it with our generation um we we're experiencing another uh you know women's empowerment movement um just like a revival of, of the empowerment movement from the 60s was coming through the millennials in the workplace now so it's very different and um and i and i get that the company wasn't really seeing the value in that and weren't really understanding um so another yeah another thing that i learned at one of these conferences was that the the this was in 2013 and i learned that the number one word to describe women in the workplace was accommodating there, there had been a survey about women in the workplace one of the questions was was the first thing was the first word that comes to mind when you think of women in the workplace and so the number one answer was accommodating and that really stuck with me and it brought shed some light on why wasn't what i was told you know i was kind of told um based on my oldest brother's experience in J.P. Morgan, you know, he he advanced really quickly in his career at J.P. Morgan. And so I got a job at a Fortune 500 company just like him and was and was told the same, you know, follow the same path, which when he was a first year associate, I was told that he would get his work done and then go around and ask people, hey, can I help you with that? What do you need help with? And from that attitude, he uh, advance quickly. So I decided I'll do the same thing. Um, my career did not advance. Um, instead, I was just given more responsibility and just became even more accommodating and an even bigger people pleaser and just kept waiting to be recognized. So there's a, also huge differences um, we, we got to keep in mind, you know, depending on the workplace culture, the same things that work for men advancing in their careers might not work for women, even though to be accommodating requires a lot of emotional intelligence, um, a lot of awareness, and in Deepak Chopra's soul of leadership, those are signs of a soulful, effective, wonderful leader but they just were not recognized in, in the catabolic corporate culture. Mm -hmm. No, I definitely 
um, I see with the point that you um, are getting across, or at least that's what I'm, I'm hearing, is that it, it, it's different. When we go into the corporate world and we want to level up, there is a difference between how a man levels up and how a woman does, because we are also perceived differently and how we offer our help right and our support um, to to the people around us for for one it's seen differently when a man does it and it's seen differently when a woman does we're, we're a woman it's accommodating it's a caregiver it's it's almost like it's her responsibility to do that uh, whereas for a man they know that he just wants to level up and move up ambition. right it, it's seen as ambition yes that's actually a great word to use for that whereas for a woman uh she just wants to help right she just wants to mother me yeah that's yeah. what it is that's where the word accommodating came yep. my boss knew if we were in the coffee room at the same time like he loved love like trying you know trying to use the the facts and copy machine and binding machine and all the things in the copy room um giving it an effort yet he he knew that if i was in there at the same time and he expressed any frustration i would go oh you know i'll do it you know don't worry about it i got it go back to your office because of that there's there is a very subtle there are subtle energetic games at play and I'm sure that's something that he learned as a kid, you know, mm. express frustration and someone comes along and it's like, oh, they were there, yeah, you know, I'll take care of it. That's who I was growing up. Yeah. If someone expresses frustration, I adjust to, to ease that frustration because of really what it does to me, um, you know, not, not liking to be around the frustration. Mm. I would also uh, add that um that men most likely say and i say most likely because i don't know right i haven't been paying attention uh for long enough to know the difference but when it comes to a man offering help to someone with the jobs that they will give a man to do would be those that will encourage growth for a woman it would be those that will allow that person to take things off their plate make yeah. things easier for themselves so all the things that they, that is not really going to encourage women to grow and um i i did notice that at the bank as well because we had uh men and women women were typically at the front line on the cash and men were in the office right they were the personal advisors so um and eventually that started changing when the word diversity started coming into pretty much every workplace and we started everyone started to diversify uh we even started having um what is this like potluck uh from all the cultures that we had in the, in the branch once a year everybody would bring food um so what i did with that um i i've noticed that women wouldn't say no to a lot of things whereas men would um and and we also did because chris you you mentioned that there was uh growth opportunities within the workplace where you learn how to be a leader if you wanted to mob, move up and do a different job that that training was there available uh from my understanding now there's a lot of those types of opportunities within the company and they you're right they don't talk about it unless you come and you ask them and then they will tell you so that's what i did at the bank is i asked i wanted to become a system manager what are the how do i do that oh we have all these courses we have this what and that courses for like everything within the bank that i could take but in order for me to let's say take um take a course if i wanted to work in the risk management uh, which would be a different completely different uh, place that i needed to go through other courses to get there um so for anyone listening watching and paying attention up until this point if you are wanting to progress at your workplace go and have that conversation with your boss mm -hmm. and ask them how do i um, how do I broaden my horizon? How do I gain more knowledge so that way I can bring more value to to this corporation? 
right? And go and take those courses. Now, Rachel, you also mentioned that there's some people that will take that information, they will not embody it, right? That they will, they understand what a leader is, but they never show up as a leader, for example. That they understand what, uh, what it takes, um, how, how to have the mental, the ha healthy mental mindset, and they do nothing about it. Mm -hmm. I've met a couple of people, um, quite a few people, more than a couple, that have read so many books uh, on personal development and mental health, and that from when I would read just the first chapter, I would already be like, oh my God, this is absolutely incredible. And I would implement it into my life. Whereas these people that read so many books, listen to so many books, so many podcasts, everything. And it's almost like they did not hear a word of what they read or what they heard. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we all take information in differently. And for the most part, there are three vortexes through which we can receive it. One is through the head, and that's just conceptual, you know, just conceptual understanding. One is through the heart. That's where we feel it. Um, and, then, and then another is through the third eye. And that's where we can perceive the deeper meaning and actually apply it in everyday life and everyday situations. So it becomes really apparent when people, especially when we're, we uh, study energy the way we do, when people have, have read a lot mm. and they retain a lot of knowledge in their head. And if it, but if it never makes it to the heart, it shows pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. it, it, it reveals itself really quickly. Like, okay, they're, they're talking a lot about this stuff. Yeah, I don't see it showing up in their actions. Um, yeah. Yeah, something else, I'm um, just going back um, to what we were saying about these differences between men and women. Uh, I'm, I'm realizing it's not, it, it has a lot to do with energy again. So for me, for example, when I first took the ELI assessment, I saw that my energetic profile showed that a huge bar of level four energy. That was my primary energy. So that was who I was in the workplace. I, mm. you know, if I, I would, I would take on the burden of others, not to advance. That wasn't my goal. I just didn't want them to be upset. Um, so it's like a young, you know, mm. one of my like young people had a date or something. I wanted to get to the gym. I'd be like, oh, you, you, I have no life. Let me do this, you know. Um, whereas in the case that I, I was told about my brother's experience of him, um, you know, being uh, extra helpful, it, it sounds more like a level three. Like he was offering his service not out of the goodness of his heart, but because he knew there was an advancement in there for him. So maybe had I had that energy of, of like, well, what's in it for me? Um, things would have would have worked out differently. But that just I was I had a lot of level four. So um, and that's really where um, and it, it goes back to self worth because my self-worth was completely attached to how much I could be in service for others, how much I could do for others without recognition. Like I wore it like a chip on my shoulder that I could accommodate and people please and, you know, care and give and take on so much of the burden, you know, pull all nighters if, mm -hmm. if I needed to without asking for help. And, um, and it was like my self-worth was based and that was, it was martyr, you know, martyr syndrome. Um, and so I think that's just a very different place uh, energetically to, to come at it. So it's not necessarily because I'm a woman, but because I'm a people pleaser. Yeah. Whereas, you know, my, my brother certainly was, he is no people pleaser. Um, he's, he's definitely like, like who know what's in it for him. Um, and that's the same, you know, when it comes to, we were talking about investments earlier and, and return on investment and, um, and, you know, why, why is investors do want to know, like, well, what's my return on investment? If I'm going to invest energy and time and money into this, you know, what am I going to see? What are the results? And that energetically, we could have different, um, 
different energy around that too. Like if it's, if you want to see like a spreadsheet with return on investment, you know, future projection showing, um, you know, that's, that's understandable. Um, when, when we're, uh, investing from those higher levels of energy, like levels five, five and six, there's a lot of faith. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we don't necessarily need a spreadsheet with proof of our return on investment. We, we've had some sort of vision and um, just have faith that it, it will come in into fruition. And if not, mm -hmm. you know, eh, <laughs> you know, nothing's lost. We believed in something yeah. and um, yeah. And so again, it just really all, all comes back to energy. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear Chris's uh, input on this male, female <laughs> talk. I have like, there's a situation ringing in my mind about when I was working at Target, I had a peer who ran the logistics, which is like truck merchandise comes in. He's in charge of getting that truck merchandise onto the sales floor and making sure the sales floor stays full all day long. And this man, this person was extremely lazy. And like, we, I would find myself and also my peer leaders would find ourselves doing his workload while he wasn't doing anything. Mm -hmm. Or he was just walking around the store because that was him being a leader. The work was still getting done, but he was utilizing the energy inappropriately. He was seeing his leadership peers as the hands that should have been doing the work along so he didn't have to do it. And like, I remember him telling one of my team leaders that like we had something going on in the store and he was supposed to be in at 3 a.m. He called, she called him to come in at like midnight or 11 so she didn't have to stay all night. And he told her to sleep on the floor and wait for her to go in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he told her to literally sleep on the floor in the office. He'll be in at his regular time. Oh, wait for him to come yeah, in. wait oh. for him to come in. He'll be in at his regular time instead of being the leader of the situation and like, okay, I'll be there as soon as possible. I understand shit's happening. Mm -hmm. That conversation would have stayed between them had she not told me and I'd begun to stuck up for her. So it's like he was abusing his leadership powers mm -hmm. and people were passively okay with it because like he was the leader and he was notoriously known as like lazy and apathetic and we all just grew those opportunity like we saw those as opportunities for ourselves be like okay let's just like counteract this apathy because it all impacts us mm -hmm. but i found that when i was able to have a tough conversation with him so like now to bring in that male female like comedy like when my team leader she tried standing up to him and nothing happened mm -hmm. nothing at all happened when she tried to stand up to him um, she went to my boss, who was the store manager, about it. Nothing happened until I was like, what the fuck? Like, she's seriously like something occurred and no one's doing anything about this. Like, you're saying a salaried person can tell somebody who's hourly just to go sleep on the floor when the salaried person is supposed to be there. Um... But then there's been other situations. Where, so I have a question. Yes. So once you spoke up, did something? Yes. You're saying she spoke up, a woman, yeah. nothing happened. Then you spoke up. Then did something happen? Yeah, something began to happen. Okay. When I stood up. Yeah. When I spoke up. And so, like, you know, to play with the energy. So he was a male counterpart, catabolic leader, causing people pleasers and empathetic leaders to rise up because we didn't want the team or the store to fail. So you, you just reminded me of something that uh, I, I learned in another 
women's leadership conference and it was that women are over mentored and under championed so you advocating for her that that i consider championship and um that's not i mean i haven't been in the workplace in, a, in about five years but um that's not something that we typically see mm -hmm. um you know i was i and from a personal uh, experience yeah i was mentored a lot and then um anytime it came time to champion me even if, if it just came up came to presenting ideas in a in a meeting um i saw a lot of my intellect being and passed off as other people's and um yeah so there is there is that um I, I imagine that still stands that women are are over mentored and under championed. I noticed like being a new age leader and having this different foresight with leadership, the carrot dangle of promotion. Mm -hmm. I saw through the illusion and I saw how that illusion impacted my team. And when I would express to them, I am going to help them get them promotion. They didn't believe me mm -hmm. because of every other past experience. Yeah. But then the team slowly starts to say, wait a second, this dude's different. Like when he's saying something, he actually is saying it and meaning it and working towards it every single day. Yeah. Um, because like once I transferred out, once I transferred out of the store, the leadership team below me, we had a hierarchy of trainees. So it was me. And then four team leaders below, three other team leaders below them, and then a pipeline of leadership that we saw within our team. The moment I left, the train of growth stopped because that upper leadership didn't understand it. They only understand it dangling the carrot of promotion to get the most energy out of somebody, not like actually following through and getting them that promotion. So within six months of me leaving, the productivity of that work center went down drastically. And earlier, the experience I shared about a team leaders trying to sabotage, that was like a female carrying masculine energy. Mm -hmm. Yes. So like, it really is a balance, like, because I carry a lot of feminine energy in my leadership. But I also like you can tell when I'm like, putting that masculine foot down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she was solely masculine, energetic leadership drive. And I can see that if for so many women that we believe that we that's what we have to do mm -hmm. yeah. um, like i know at my former company it seemed like the the female partners they thought they had to put put on that masculine um i don't know if i want to use masculine because it this was not a, this was an unbalanced masculine the mm -hmm. um the ruthless you know the ruthlessness is a, a characteristic of an unbalanced masculine energy um balanced masculine energy is wonderful, it's protective. Um, but the ruthlessness, yeah, that's that's coming from an unbalanced True. masculine energy. So um so yeah, there were there were definitely women at my former workplace who practiced that, like ruthlessness, talking, um, playing the roles of sycophant, like going to the bosses with information on other people because of the game that that is being played. And I and I understand it because you know, how do women get ahead? Mm -hmm. And it's weird to even describe it as getting ahead. Like, again, it's been a while. So even talking about these patterns seems like what kind of world were we all in? <laughs> but yeah, there's the it's it is a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. um, there are partners, there are associates, there are, you know, um, I, the the people who produce the most money for the company seem to be treated the best those who are not producers seem to be neglected forgotten mm -hmm. like we had a whole 
accounting department and I didn't think they were treated that well. Um, you know, every year around Christmas, that's when the big producers would come down to the accounting team and be like, hey, did my checks come through and like schmooze and try to be buddies and friends. Uh, but, you know, they weren't inviting the accounting team to go with them to the golf course. Um, and they're the plumbing. They're the ones that are yeah. allowing the whole thing to work. They're writing the checks for these people. Literally. Like, yeah. Writing the checks and and they go down check on their checks mm -hmm. you know maybe once or four times a year like where's mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm waiting on a ninety thousand dollar check is it here is it here and this is someone who's getting paid like thirty thousand dollars a year um to sit in in the, their you know cube numbers for yeah eight hours a day and crunch numbers and um and i remember i actually learned a lot there was a, a time where um my office wasn't ready yet and I went and and worked with, in the accounting department like a cube like my, my cubicle was, was in there with them and I actually learned a lot from them because if their work wasn't done like I remember um this one woman her work her work she didn't get through the you know her pile of work and then these people would sit there they wouldn't socialize they wouldn't get distracted on the mm -hmm. internet they would just sit there and do the numbers day after day focused they don't have time for that yeah mm -hmm. and then five o'clock would come and they would be done and i learned so much from that like i remember watching her like close up shop she wasn't done done with the hour but she was like i am um, i'm done i'm leaving it's five o'clock I got paid for, you know, nine to five and I'm done. And I actually, I really respected that because yeah, why would you, you know, mm -hmm. you don't get paid enough to stay late for, for these people who like, you know, work one day and get a $90,000 check. Thank you. You brought up a great thing because asking for growth opportunities opens up the opportunity for somebody to take advantage of you. Oh, uh, yeah. Like I want to grow in I want to grow in a work center and like the catabolic leaders is like, huh, yay, like free energy. Yeah. Free energy. Where this one's like, I'm out at five. Somebody that may want to grow up, like grow in the company will stay till six. Yeah. But that's that's boundaries right there. That mm -hmm. woman that you're talking about, she had a boundary where I am here yeah. from nine to five. And I'm not working past that because you're not paying me for that. Yep. Um, I actually had the same mentality at work as well. When I was at the bank, I'm here nine to five. If I'm at, staying past my clock, my my time is worth money. Yep. Right? So eventually they stopped paying overtime. So all of us, everyone learned that you got to be out at that time or a little bit before sometimes. But that's what you, you guys are expressing is boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, and to what you just said, Chris, is that some some bosses, and I call them bosses, they're not leaders, right? They will take advantage of you coming to them and asking for growth opportunities because you want to grow within the company. Um, so with saying that, it's important to have that uh, conversation with that boss, as in when can I expect to have... Uh, finish all of these, right? What am I going to get afterwards? Yep. Uh, sometimes it can be, I mean, things have changed now. Back then, the phones weren't as advanced as they are now. But perhaps maybe you can ask to voice record this conversation <laughs> as proof <laughs> that this is actually going to happen because, um, especially if it happened in the past where you brought this, uh, you brought this request where you want to grow and you were taken advantage of you want to prevent yourself from being taken advantage of in, in this in this case, in, in this opportunity. So find a way of how you can make sure that um, doesn't happen again, mm -hmm. or doesn't happen the first time. Because if we can prevent it from happening in the first place, then life would be a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I wouldn't have to carry that experience with us, but if it has happened to you um, or if you were promised that you were going to become um, 
let's say assistant manager at, by a certain point in time and it didn't happen and years went by and you continue to give and give and give uh, because you got to practice these skills before you go and do that job yeah. so that's where they we can find ourselves being taken advantage of yeah i was just gonna say i'm really enjoying the like this topic of conversation because we're giving solutions to how to uncover wealth in the moment mm -hmm. like if we're already going to this place of employment every day how can we reframe it to get the most energetic exchange mm -hmm. for that hour like what can we do i'm already there for 40 hours a week how can i reframe it so that 40 hours a week has better energetic return mm -hmm. it's all there and we can take advantage of it like in these conversations just asking for growth asking what the timeline is asking how we can expand it's just helping us unlock it mm -hmm. yeah yeah and the bosses take advantage as well and that's the reason why i started and pretty much all of us at the at the bank started saying that we're not saying pass our time because sometimes we would stay there like half an hour or an hour longer for free and that stuff adds up yep. and we had to decide that our time was worth something and that this is not okay. So without knowing that this was a boundary, all of us had a boundary that we're not staying past this time unless we're getting paid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I was gonna say something, you remind me of something um, when I've slipped. Uh, yeah, I can't remember. <laughs> I'm sure it'll come back. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, it, um, if, if anyone's watching and you're in a, a company, um, well, some classic company moves or mindsets are, um, I think if this is a message that's been programmed into so many of us is, you stay, you get your foot in the door at a good company, you stay there a certain number of years, the longer you stay there, the more clout I guess you have, um, the more respect, the more um, awards you get, like, you know, maybe vacation it grows from two weeks paid vacation or three weeks, whatever the benefits are. Five in Canada. Yeah, hey. yeah. And um, yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I want to stay at a job so that you have five weeks of paid vacation and 10 sick days a year. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I remember looking at these benefits. I was like, ooh, in 10 years, I'll get this. And in 15 years, 20 years, you know, I'm thinking like, ooh, this is so great. Oh, I look forward to when I'm here for 20 years. Um, I was there for seven years. It's a long time. And, and I was there for seven years because of that mindset that I was, I was spoon fed. And because of that mindset, there was major stigma around marketing yourself and checking out other options. So, and my, my boss uh, kind of like, I was his um, spy kind of, if people were looking at other options, I would report back to him and like so-and-so was looking at, you know, our competitor, JLL and yada, yada. And he's like, Ooh, you know, um, and then like, good girl, good girl, you did a good job, good job telling me. And I'm like, yeah, huh. uh, <laughs> maybe my bonus will be bigger now. Um, but yeah, market yourself, you know, know your worth. If, if you're gonna, there, there's, let's dissolve that stigma. If mm. you're gonna get paid more at another company, jump Go ship uh, and keep, ju like this is, keep, it's, jumping, keep jumping ship, play the game. You know, yeah. there it's it's a lie. It's a lie that there's all this prestige and being at a, a company for so long. That's yeah, who cares? It doesn't work anymore. <laughs> that that model's outdated. Yeah. So yeah, really know your worth. Market yourself. Talk to other headhunters. If you're not happy at your company, if you believe you could be paid more, there is no stigma. Mm -hmm. Um, and if there are spies like I was, fuck them. You know, let them tell because that energy that it took, it took my boss so much energy to spy on all of us. And, and that paranoia, that's why my conversations with him 
why he felt he was underdressed because of that paranoia that I was going to leave in any given moment because millennials, like there's all this stigma about being a millennial because we company hop. Damn right we company hop, we know our worth. So there's no stigma. If, if you, yeah, market yourself, know your worth, research how much your, your position gets paid in other companies. If you're not getting paid well, um you know and and we're we're all here to support you if you want if you want just like a little you know <laughs> little moral support or a lot of moral support we're here we yeah <laughs> fuck them <laughs> yeah i mean it, honestly i think it's part of uh part of the game to keep us from um build, uh, from for, to keep us from understanding the the truth of that we are worth a lot more than what our bosses or their bosses bosses are telling us where you know the company owner or the ceo is at the very top who decides who gets paid what his two two um assistants they get paid something their assistants they get paid something um and then it kind of trickles down but the person on top is the one that's making the most money mm -hmm. so having been in network marketing this is one of the things I've learned where everybody says, oh, this is a pyramid scheme, pyramid scheme. But if we look at any corporation, yep. mm -hmm. every one of them looks like a pyramid because the person on top is who is earning the most. Whereas in network marketing, depending the structure of network marketing, but for the most part, um, all the ones that I have been exposed to, I haven't. I haven't seen myself otherwise is that you earn depending on how much work you put in yourself and if you put in let's say 10 hours in you're gonna get 10 hours work but then again depends what kind of work you're actually gonna be doing whereas when you're working on salary based or hourly based you have this person on top who looks at how much money you're going to bring in and how much he's willing to give you a cut of what you're bringing in yep, yep for your work yeah and you know what? that person whatever person's on top they they also have someone who's higher than them somewhere mm -hmm. along the lines and so like where does it end mm -hmm. so like the person at the the top of the biggest pyramid is determining the worth of the person at the top of the smaller pyramid mm -hmm. and so on and it's like where does it end are these people even happy end? um mm -hmm. And then something else just, you know, they don't care where if we're at a company like like my company, for example, you know, I was a, an associate when I left, I was, um, what was I, vice president of, I, I forget, I think an associate. Um, yeah, uh, they don't care. You know, I, I'm just a cog in the machine. They don't, mm -hmm. care, you know, I, I remember thinking it, it's such a big deal when people leave, like I develop relationships with people. And then before they leave, there'd be like, you know, three months of like gossiping and, and discontent and, and being like, I'm, I'm never to have it. I'm going to look into other companies. And I'd be like, oh no, just like, wait, you know? And I think it was such a big deal. Then finally they leave the company the next day that would, okay, delete their emails and, uh, you know, re, or like redirect their emails to so and so, and uh, that's it. They're gone. Moving on. They don't care. They yeah. don't care. So if anyone is is holding on because you think your company cares, they don't care. You know, <laughs> We're no all replacing. Huh? For me, it was because they can't survive without me because I am the best. Um, and this was again external validation. Everybody was like, "Oh, you're the best. You're the fastest. You're this. You're that." And it's like, yeah, it was good. My ego was just growing. Oh, yeah. so that's why I didn't want to leave because I didn't want to go somewhere else and not be the best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I quickly learned uh, very quickly within within months of uh, working at the bank um, how disposable. Yes. Yeah. 
everyone is not the management because they take a lot longer to train them but the frontliners you know the medium workers the the, the bottom feeders as you know sometimes we were we were called um, how disposable we were and how once in a while we'd have I always refer to them as the big kahunas you know the bosses bosses the uh, the vice president of the district would come in and talk to us and because they want to hear our input they want to hear what's going on how we're doing and I called it bullshit right away because I'm like oh my god I can see you're like you're not people are talking and um it's the way that I saw it is um what do you call them I forgot the word politicians they're like politicians where uh, yeah. you're saying and in the end there nothing comes out of it, it I mean I was just like well what's the point of it but I took that time to just get to know the person and who they were and how they showed up and it, it there was a little bit of I'm better than you in there energy even though it wasn't spoken out loud this is a strong energy you can feel it like yeah. and that we're all supposed to fawn mm -hmm. when the big kahunas come through and treat them like they're celebrities yeah. like shine. and i had so much respect for well while i was there my admin she didn't give a fuck who you were um if you disrespected her she, you would know that it was not okay and for her there was no um you know, no idealizing or fawning or like she she had a lot of respect for herself and she was there to do her job, keep her head down, get paid. Um, so I, I really enjoyed watching the way she she navigated it. Um, but yeah, as you're saying, um, something that came to mind just in terms of like the show that they put on um i remember at one of our every year we'd have a summer outing the whole new england portion of the company would go to some like fancy place um or yeah like one year but the last year i went we were in a year where we go i forget oh new uh where do they have that festival uh eh, it doesn't matter um so it was like a place where people have weddings and stuff and um and they invited a keynote speaker and he was speaking to the whole company and everyone was like in the in the gathering place listening and i just got up and left and then um and went and kind of like stood behind it my boss was actually back there too and he was like i thought you'd be all into this stuff why aren't you in there and like i don't even think i could answer him because I like I felt anger and rage and I was like yes I am into this stuff and it is what I've been saying for years <laughs> um but it's because of what you're saying like I, I knew it was bullshit I called yeah. you know there's no point how many times are we gonna listen to this stuff over and over listen to mm -hmm. leadership and you know how many times are they gonna recommend that our leaders read the same book like rookie smart, read rookie smart, and it doesn't happen. Um, so yeah, I just empathize with uh, you know calling bullshit, like seeing it, and you're like it's not working. Like how how do you expect us to fall for this? Well, at the same time, I understand the deep internal work it takes to make those consciousness shifts. So they might think that they are changing because of listening to some speaker come in and talk about organizational health. Um, but it doesn't happen like it's it's like we were talking about coaching Anna like in one coach program, you might learn the con concepts of being a coach, whereas in IPEC learn how to embody being a coach It's the same with leadership, you might learn some concepts like growth mindset versus fixed mindset. But unless you go through a really thorough internal process, it, you don't really change. You don't change until you feel it. And I think that's exactly what happens with people that are taking in, like when, you, when we were talking earlier that some people, you can tell that they have the knowledge, 
but they don't embody it. And it's because they, they have the knowledge, that quote again that I said, that life is not an information process it's an application process they're missing the second part of uh, of life they are learning the information so they have all the knowledge but they're not doing anything with it and doing something with it means that whatever you learn you are actually applying it into your own life and you're taking the time to work through it and uncover what does that mean to me and you bring the heart into it right you connect the mind with the heart where the mind has all information but if you don't do the actual work if you don't apply it then you're not embodying it and embodying is the connection with the heart because we work through that yeah and that like the working through that ooh, it can bring up a lot of shadows so like leaders, Look, it does you know leaders have a lot of attachment to power for example mm -hmm. at another leadership conference we were told that leaders who have a lot of power over others for them equity feels like oppression so if if they've been living a life of privilege exploiting others then when those who've been exploited say we'd we'd like to be treated well now it feels like those who have been exploited are, are oppressing those who have been living in power. So that's a lot of ego attachment and shadow work that has to take place for people in positions of power. Um, it, they've got to learn how to let go of whatever power means to them mm -hmm. and, and replace it with trust that if you invest emotionally and, and from a, a place of love and um and trust that it will result in the kinds of growth that they actually want to see and it frees up so much energy you don't have to control anymore mm -hmm. you don't have to spend you know you don't you can release that paranoia of oh they're gonna leave unless i make up some ex ex elaborate lie and get everybody to play along with the lie so that this this person stays um actually another thing uh, one of the reasons my boss i i like at once in a while I become aware that this is on, on Facebook live and I'm like whatever it's just you know uh, if, if he ever sees it I don't think any of this is a surprise. Wait, say yeah that. in case my old boxes watch hi yeah remember me <laughs> motherfucker no, just I yeah. actually have a lot a lot of love for them you know after the fact um once I've healed but um a lot of the reasons why like after seven years at that company I knew a lot I had seen a lot and that's really why he wanted me to stay. He didn't mm -hmm. want me to stay because I was I was not replaceable. I was very replaceable, um, but I knew a lot. I had a lot of information on a lot of people, and that's where the paranoia comes from. And so, um, it's really yeah, really weird culture. Yeah, that's why most people are forced to sign a paper saying that you're not gonna give all the secrets out. That's basically when I left, uh, they're like, we'll give you this much money, but you got to sign this paper. This is yeah. pretty much that I'm not going to say anything about what I saw. Yeah, uh, it's a uh, hash money, right? That's what it's called. Shush, yeah. Yeah. Hush, 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 hush money. Yeah. Hush money. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, I don't care. Give me the money. And people after the fact were like, you could sue. Why don't you sue? And I was like, Back then I was like, that's level two energy. I don't want to spend any time in level two. Um, thinking back to, to like what I was explaining, I'm like, they have no idea what I meant. <laughs> but I was like, I want to be in level six. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's just, it just wasn't worth the energy. Um, but yeah, like once you recognize, oh, that's why they want me. They're just afraid of, of like what secrets I'm going to share. Um, it's really telling what kind of an organ organization it is especially after watching that documentary about Jeffrey Epstein and seeing just like that's just you know that's just the way like holding things over people's heads mm -hmm. like blackmailing people mm -hmm. um that's how a lot of people learn how to play the game and I think like doing that blackmail is a way to bypass pattern recognition mm -hmm. and to bypass actually healing yourself as a leader 
uh, some of the best leaders I've ever been around, seen, looked up to, admired. Like they notice patterns and they work to become in alignment with the patterns and whatever that alignment is with the pattern so it doesn't repeat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If the pattern repeats, I've seen leaders be like, oh, I'm noticing this pattern repeat and like recognize that the pattern's repeating and recognize that I'm working on it, I'm gonna continue to work at it. Uh -huh. Instead of just like continuously bringing the pattern to the forefront month after month after month. Mm -hmm. It was like, where's the leadership? Right. Where is the leadership if you keep presenting yourself with this own personal pattern mm -hmm. and you're not working to fix it? Like a leader is working on themselves just as much as they are working on whatever it is that they're leading. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember around the, the Me Too movement, when the Me Too movement was picking up picking up steam uh i was contacted by someone who worked a lot with my my former um employers and he was like you know they're all getting kind of concerned that you're gonna do something and i was like what like do something and i was like well you know what that's their own personal hell if they sexually harassed women and now they're all freaked out that i'm gonna like rally the women to, to do something like that's their own personal hell and that's something that um okay um that's something that you know they can do their own shadow work so it's nothing to do with me that's i've been gone for over a year they're all freaked out like that says something about them it has nothing to do with me um but so i know you you gotta go what time is it um yeah, we've been, been yeah, really, we've been going, going for it. Um, I'm just going to check, make sure um, we don't have any questions on Facebook. We didn't really get that into. Um, this is what Pasha looks like. Pasha, right? um, cool. Yeah, we've been, all right, cool. So just a few comments, no questions, it looks like. So cool. Well. Thank you. And uh, just close out with our um, letter C from Deepak Chopra's Creating Influence. So C stands for care, freeness, and charity. A billion dollars in the bank without the experience of care, freeness, and charity is a state of poverty. Wealth consciousness, by definition, is a state of mind. If you are constantly concerned about how much money you need, then irrespective of the actual dollar amount you have in your account, you are really poor. Carefreeness automatically leads to charity and sharing because the source from which it all comes is infinite, unbounded, and inexhaustible. I love that one. So much true to that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. We can have a whole conversation around that one. Yeah. <laughs> Another start with next time we'll start with the, the, the letter um, and see where it goes yeah i want to do cool. that yeah right. so next week we'll start with reading letter d Ooh, i'll one. tell you right now it stands for demand and supply so we'll, we'll, oh we'll, that's gonna be a great topic <laughs> <laughs> so next week we'll start with that i'll cool. read it and then yeah these can we can guide our topics that way uh, and I'm yeah. sure it will twist and turn as it does. <laughs> yeah. Well, this was um, a great conversation about like personal autonomy and leadership and how you can discover your own wealth mm -hmm. by like your own choices. This is really good. Cool. This, felt, this felt good. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. And just send in love so to good. all of our former companies. I'm so grateful we all have had the experience we have had that has led here. And as much as I speak about the catabolic aspects of my former companies and we, we you know, do to share our experience, I'm so grateful for the experience. So Me too. I'm very that. grateful. And I, I've had a lot of people also tell me, you should, you know, Sue, you should have had her fired. Uh, but I, I don't because I always understood that there was a bonus for me as well and a learning experience for anyone involved. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Wow. <laughs> Thank Sweet. you.
Until and next week. Until next time. Yes. Love. Bye. 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 <laughs>